Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Support comes from the University of Alaska College Savings Plan, helping you and your child save for college every step of the way, from diapers to diploma. More information at uacollegesavings.com. The National Weather Service. Good Wednesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 27th of January, almost finished with the first month of the year. Hard to believe it's going so fast. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with the local weather situation in your community, and you can easily do that by going to weather.gov slash Alaska or give us a call on the weather info line. We've been having a little trouble with some lines in some areas, but this number, I checked today myself, should work. 800-472-0391 if it doesn't. Email me, text me, Twitter me, Facebook me, whatever you like to do, and I'll be happy to help you out, okay? 800-472-0391. This morning did work. On Facebook, NWS Alaska is a great way to keep up to date with the rest of the weather story in between your Alaska weather segments on uh, Twitter, NWS Alaska, with the hashtag AKWX. You post a picture of the moose in your backyard or the aurora overhead or the snow you see in Kotzebue, if you have any snow or the rain you're seeing in Juneau and the record temperatures that are probably pretty close to happening across some parts of the capital city again for the second day in a row. We'd love to see that. Use the hashtag AKWX and no matter if you follow our account or not, it's a great way to bring us into the conversation and let us know you're talking about Alaska weather. And of course, in the afternoon, you can get your daily afternoon map briefings on YouTube. You can subscribe to those and you can get the short version before you watch the long version right here on Alaska weather. So thanks for watching. Here's a look at the hazardous weather situation. As we look up toward the Klondike Highway once again, we have a winter weather advisory until 9 o'clock tonight. About uh, 2,500 feet and higher is what we're talking about for a total snowfall of about 4 to 9 inches. That'll slowly wind down as we head into the evening and overnight hours. However, we also have rain and a lot of warm air moving through southeastern Alaska. As a result, any of that warmth that gets up on top of the snow could create some melting, could create some ice and slippery conditions, so be extra careful there. <coughs> Excuse me. And looking up northward, as we look at the uh, Beaufort Sea Coast, you'll see uh, winter weather advisories there. We have blowing and drifting snow and maybe occasional and additional light snowfall expected there, but for many locations, it's just going to be a, a steady and uh, wind that's probably about 25 to 35 miles per hour and gusts from 35 to 45 are expected in that area. As a result, uh, visibility could drop anywhere from Barrow to Kafkovic, and uh, that winter weather advisory will continue along the northern coast uh, with additional accumulations under one inch until about midnight tonight. So plan on some tricky travel in those areas, but again, not the worst or the worst that we've seen this week. Looking out west, though, we still have blizzard conditions across the western tip of the Seward Peninsula and the St. Lawrence Island and the seacoast there. That will go until at least 9 o'clock tonight and probably on into uh, Thursday and Friday. Looking for northerlies gusting up to 60 miles per hour and additional snowfall, a couple inches expected there. Uh, that is going to uh, bring up uh, probably as much as 4 inches in some locations, but the visibility is, is the worst of that. Now, we'll probably get most of the snow as we head through tonight and tomorrow, but once that snow is on the ground, I'm sorry, the strongest winds will be tonight and into early tomorrow. The winds will subside a little bit as we get into Thursday and Friday. However, once we add that new snow, it'll be easier for it to blow around. So blizzard conditions could continue into Friday for the western tip of the Seward Peninsula and St. Lawrence Island. So once again, the winds are the big problem tonight. Once we get a little bit more snow as we get into Thursday night and Friday, it will still be capable of being pushed around. And again, blizzard conditions, poor visibility, falling snow, and gusty winds, uh, all part of the mix there. Not to be left out, our friends on the Yukon Delta there. In Yupik country, we are talking about a winter weather advisory for you. Also expecting some uh, gusty winds there, but predominantly a little bit of light snow is expected. Uh, two inches there, so a little bit of wind, and again, some poor visibility, generally about a half mile or less, but not quite as bad as what our friends a little bit further north have. 
up in uh, St. Lawrence Island and the western tip of the Seward Peninsula. So a lot going on. A lot of it really has to do with wind and snow, but some places have not seen that much snow. Any guesses? Yeah, capital city really scraping the bottom of the barrel this year for snow. In fact, it looks a very similar to 1942. That would be pre-World War II time, uh, well, since about World War II, a uh, trace of snow back in 42. So far this January, only a trace has been reported there in Judo, and we're really not expecting any more to fall through the rest of the month. If that stays true, this will be one of the lowest, or if not the lowest, tied for it, uh, snow-free Januarys in Juneau because we don't count a trace as actual snowfall. One snowflake doesn't cut it. You need a tenth of an inch or more to actually register as snowfall. So pretty low stuff. 1981 had 2.4, 1987 had 3.3. Those were certainly low years, especially when you consider the average is 27.7. That's when you take 30 years, add them all up, divide by 30, that would be the number you get. So not a whole lot of snow in the capital city this year in Juneau. It has been a warm, warm month. Now, the satellite picture and onto the forecast. You see low pressure once again in the Gulf and several waves out around that showing some blossoming convection. That's upward moving air. That means showers. That probably means thunderstorms and we'll have the opportunity for some isolated thunderstorms and convection to continue around the Gulf and outside of Prince William Sound and outside of the Kenai Peninsula as we get into the next 24 hours. You can also see clouds moving and zipping right over southeastern Alaska today. Uh, the wind not as bad as what it was in previous days. The rain not as bad as what it was in previous days, in most locations anyway. And snow continuing to move up the Klondike Highway. So once again, a winter weather advisory there until about 9 o'clock tonight for uh, snow total accumulations of 4 to 9. Probably most of that you've already seen. As we look into the interior, a lot of those clouds are making it over the hills but not a lot seems to be falling from them. There's a lot of dry air underneath that, and uh, you'll notice a lot of that is working its way up to the northern coast too, and once it, this circulation meets the north and western coast, it's really turning into a windmaker, and in some cases a snowmaker, as we've seen for St. Lawrence Island and the Yukon Delta, as well as uh, many along the western tip of the Seward Peninsula. Everything else behind it, this is pretty dry stuff. There are several waves of low pressure trying to work their way into the Bering Sea. One of those is kind of hovering around uh, the Bristol Bay region, and that's really just kind of keeping the ice in check. But for many other locations across the Bering, sea ice is progressing in a decent clip now to the south and west. Uh, not quite toward the continental shelf, but uh, it is making some progress down to the southwest. We'll check that out in just a little bit. As we look at the Gulf, here's our front working up towards southeast, rounding the curve through Prince William Sound and over Kodiak Island. Uh, the low of the center anyway is around 955 millibars. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of air that's mixing up around uh, Alaska, but I, I just couldn't draw a cold front or a warm front today. Most of this are just little waves or perturbations that are working around the overall circulation, and each one of them kicks up a few more clouds, a little more wind, sometimes snow. And up north, it, it is. It's really just a lot of wind kind of exacerbating and helping to add that uh, stronger wind flow across the north and western coast. Snow showers will continue there tonight. Again, a few places looking at additional accumulations along the north coast. And once again, blizzard conditions continue across the Bering Strait community. Some light snow still possible around the Yukon Delta. Rain and snow showers are possible for the central and eastern chain as well as the Alaska Peninsula. And our wind is relaxing across the northern and uh, eastern coast. It looks like uh, there will still be some visibility restrictions for aviation tomorrow. There will still be some chop out at sea. And there will probably be some uh, turbulence for uh, general aviation. Uh, probably not such a big deal for the, the big heavies, but uh, it does look like we're going to see uh, at least a little bit of a tighter pressure gradient than uh, normal thanks to the position of the low. Now, out around the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys, low pressure starts to move into the region tomorrow at 978 millibars. Guess what? That keeps warm air around Cook Inlet and maybe just enough warm air around the Anchorage Bowl and the Matanuska and Susitna Valleys to create a little bit of freezing rain from time to time. Chances are we're going to see rain and snow kind of come and go. It'll, it'll be kind of an on and off again situation. Snow showers around Prince William Sound, rain and snow for the chain and all the way through the Alaska Peninsula. It looks like mostly rain for Kodiak Island and snow and wind continue for St. Lawrence Island and places as close to Nome and Norton Sound as uh, probably uh, the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta still looking at snow and then poor visibility and blowing snow for the Arctic coast rain for most of southeast. That trend continues for Friday. 
A low pressure continues working its way northward. This is going to be a little different than the last couple days. This wave gets a little bit into uh, the northern parts of the Yukon Delta and in the Norton Sound. That could push warmer air northward, so we'll have to keep an eye on see how much of this actually stays snow. There's still plenty of cold air to be had in the interior, but we've been working that warm air northward and further and further north the last couple days too. The next trick is what happens to the low out across the central and western chain. This starts working eastward. A front remains intact moving across the central and eastern chain heading toward Mikulski and Dutch Harbor and Akatan. That's going to bring up a stronger southerly push. That means more warm air is working into the Kuskokwim Bay and Bristol Bay region. And again, that's going to have impacts on ice, so we'll keep watch on that. In the meantime, snow and rain showers still passing through south central. The interior generally dry, occasionally a better chance for some light snow around Ambler and Bettles, but that's about it. Not a whole lot going on in the interior. Temperature wise, 40s and 50s. Yes, 50s in southeast today. Sitka down toward Ketchikan and Annette Hyder made it into the upper 30s today. Looking at rainfall after snow the other day and low 40s for the capital city. Gustavus also in the mid 40s. Same for Yakutat, 42 in Cordova, 37 in Valdez, 39 in Anchorage today. Uh, Seward made it to 41, Middleton Island 45, so you can tell there's warmth and warm water out there as well. 24 in Fairbanks, 12 in Fort Yukon, 27 in Eagle. And looking further northward, it was mild along the north coast as well. Three, four, five degree temperatures there from Barrow at five degrees above, eight above in Kaktovik, 14 above in Kivalina, 21 in Kotzebue, 12 in Shishmarep, and 28 in Nome. Even Galena was above zero at 20 degrees today, 27 in McGrath. These are usually really cold spots this time of year, 23 in Bethel. 23 in Nunavak Island, 9 for St. Lawrence Island. At least they're in the single digits. So low to mid 30s for Bristol Bay. Lower 40s for Kodiak Island on either end. And mid 30s for the Alaska Peninsula, Sandpoint 39, 32 in St. Paul. And low 30s for Adak and Atka, 27 out of that too. Now overnight low temps will stay in the teens, 20s, and 30s for South Central. Anything south of the Alaska Range into the south and west. Uh, looks to be fairly close to freezing, if not just a little bit below, but uh, some cases closer to the coast and the Bering, they're going to be pretty cold. Lower 20s there for Nunavak Island, 18 in Nome, 0 for Barrow, 9 for Fort Yukon. Southeast, well above freezing, upper 30s and low 40s for you. Any precipitation for most places there in the rain plain, 29 for Valdez, lower 30s for the Alaska Peninsula, and just a hair below freezing for the central chain. High temps tomorrow go back into the mid 30s. Southwest, lower to mid 30s there, Bristol Bay and uh, you know King Salmon, about 35 degrees. Nome 22, 7 in Barrow, upper 20s, upper 20s in Fairbanks in January. Lower 30s for South Central, looks like Anchorage close to the freezing point tomorrow, and upper 30s and 40s for Southeast. Here's a look at flying weather now. We expect IFR conditions, especially the ground blizzard kind of IFR from Kaktovik and north of Point Barrow. Look for a wide path for IFR conditions from the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island, Nunavak Island, all the way down to Cape Newingham and pushing into Bristol Bay. But, but then we get into the warm air and that's going to help keep things open there for most of Bristol Bay. Look for IFR from Prince William Sound eastward to uh, Yakutat and Icy Cape. And IFR conditions mainly along the higher train in southeast, but some of that could sneak into Cross Sound, so keep your watch on that. Most of the Alaska range looks pretty good. Let's start up north, though. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass probably holding around MVFR through most of the day. Some improvement in the afternoon. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass look to hold around IFR in the morning, then some gradual improvement during the daytime. It looks like Rainy Pass should hold near MVFR. Windy Pass looks pretty good. VFR there and for Isabel Pass during the day. Mentasta Pass we expect to be okay at VFR. Uh, Tanita Pass, uh, marginal conditions through most of the day. Portage Pass, it looks like there's going to be rain and low clouds through most of the day on the eastern side. And Chilkoot and White Pass expect to be MVFR. That warm air that we saw packed into southeast yesterday has spread back out across the Gulf. Levels there as high as 2,000 feet. The surface freezing line remains unchanged, hovering very close to the Privlovs and then dropping back toward Attu. Remember, we saw temperatures there in the upper 20s. Icing potential is fairly broad. Looks for isolated moderate across parts of southeast. A better chance for occasional moderate across uh, the Susitna Valley and the Anchorage Bowl. This should be orange there, so occasional moderate above 4,000 feet and hit and miss across the North Slope and the Privlovs. The jet stream still showing that very broad superhighway pattern of weather that's well south of Alaska. We have these little bursts of wind coming in, but notice they're all from the south. They're not pointed from the north, drawing that colder air down in a big way. So 
winters just kind of barely holding on it seems like in this kind of pattern. At 9,000 feet our main circulation is just west of Nunavak Island and east of the Pribilovs. That puts most of the Gulf in a broad southerly flow especially southeast and the interior for that matter. Don't forget about uh, folks up north 15 and 20 knot winds there coming in from the south and then bending back to the west as they cross over the Chukchi Sea coast. Southerlies remain light at 3,000 feet here. You can see several circulations, some of those over Norton Sound. That's helping to aid that warm air working up across the YK Delta and into the Western Brooks Range. Northerlies, though, also aiding blizzard conditions there across the Bering Strait and the northern Bering Sea pushing the ice further south. Turbulence potential, yeah, there's going to be more tomorrow across St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait below 4,000 feet. A hit and miss chop across the central and eastern chain into places like Sand Point, Cold Bay and Falls Pass. Watch for some chop across the middle Yukon Valley and across uh, areas near uh, the uh, western and southwestern ranges as well as uh, eastern parts of Prince William Sound and still a little bit of hit and miss chap, uh, chop and some uh, gap winds. Probably some chap too if you stick your face out the window below 4,000 feet across some parts of the Panhandle for your Thursday. And that is your aviation forecast. I'll be back with a look at the ice edge here and more in just a few minutes. Welcome to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And joining us once again is our good friend Eric Stevens from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska. Uh, he is here and has been here many times to talk to us about weather satellites and how those can help Alaskans understand our weather, how we can do better detection, keep more people safe from things even like volcanic ash. But today, Eric, you're going to talk to us a little bit more about weather satellites and how that can keep Alaskans safe and protect our property from wildfire, right? That's right, Dave. Uh, today's topic is uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh -huh. And uh, thanks for having us back again to Alaska Anytime. Weather. Well, um, weather satellites have a lot of different instruments on them. Uh -huh. It turns out that the electromagnetic spectrum has a lot going on in it, and only one part of that is visible light, what we see. Right. Weather satellites, of course, report that. Today's topic is wildfires. Okay. There are some people who say that in Alaska in the summertime, you don't have severe weather. These people are usually from Oklahoma <laughs> or somewhere. And, and F5 tornadoes tend not to occur in Alaska. Right. People have also said what we do have in the summer. What is Alaska's severe summer weather can be hydrology, right. flash flood and, and uh, erosion mm -hmm. in the mountains and things like that, and fires, right. wildfires. Absolutely. Those were here in 2004, certainly remember that. We've got an example here. From 2014, mm -hmm. now it was a quiet season overall, but in May, down on the Kenai Peninsula, we had a uh, wildfire on the Funny River, mm -hmm. and this is a satellite image from a satellite, a polar orbiter that went right over Alaska, mm -hmm. and we can see the plume of smoke coming out of that fire on the Kenai, curling down, it's caught in the wind, right. it goes down toward Kodiak Island, curves around, you can see it circulating around a low pressure system that's in the Gulf yeah, of Alaska. That was a beautiful picture. Oh my gosh. Except there was a fire. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fire there. The nice thing is with this satellite image, you can tell where, this, where the fire origin is, where right. the smoke is coming from. And um, it's a color image. We're looking at the wavelength spectrum of about 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers or microns. Mm -hmm. That's what the human eye would see. If you were riding on the satellite and looked down, you could see this kind of an image. Right. So that's pretty nice. But it turns out there's more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just visible light. Okay. You've heard of infrared ultraviolet, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. If we move into longer wavelengths, let's go to one specifically, 3.7 microns. Okay, 3.7. Why worry about that one? Okay. Well, we've got an example here. 3.7, it turns out, happens to be very sensitive to a certain temperature range, temperatures where fires burn. Okay. And so we've got an example zoomed in a little more from that same Funny River fire mm -hmm. down on the Kenai Peninsula, and we can see that you get up into a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right. and that's where the colors are. We can see there, um, on the Funny River Fire to the west and to the east, almost a horseshoe shape there, mm -hmm. is not only we're seeing where the fire is in a general sense, but specifically where it's the active so fire That is where front. it's burning right now. Mm -hmm. And Amazing. it's 3.7 okay. microns is the important temperature there. Okay. That's right. So it, this is really important to firefighters on the ground, people that are making plans and directing the firefighters and where they need to go and cut the trenches and keep people safe. You know it. Wow. If you want to fight that fire, you got to know where it is. Okay. You got to know the leading edge. We've also got a movie loop, nothing mm -hmm. quite like animating it in time. Yeah. You can see the fire spreading out over time with a succession of film cool. or a succession of uh, images. Mm -hmm. Now this is one channel, 3.7 micron. You know, we looked at that color smoke image before. Right. 
and that's actually a red, a green, and a blue. That's how you get color imagery. Uh -huh. What if you took three different wavelengths in the infrared? You went from like um, 2.2 micron, 1.5 micron, up to 3.7. You mix them together, you get this other kind of color image, which is even a better way to oh, wow. sharply bring out the details of where that leading edge of the fire is. Okay. You'll note, though, in the infrared, guess what? We don't see the smoke. Uh, That's too that's bad. Okay. And on these movie loops, you can see the clouds go by. These channels can't see through clouds. The lesson is there's no one perfect solution. You've got to okay. have the visible, you've got to have some of that infrared single 3.7 channel, some of that infrared mixing mm -hmm. to help get a different perspective. Another one, we've talked before about a, a fun channel called the Day Night Band. Yes, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. And in Alaska in the winter, it's great. We've got all this darkness. The Day Night Band is so sensitive to seeing light, uh -huh. um, you can see features that otherwise aren't available. Now, in Alaska, when you have a forest fire, it tends to be light out all the time. Right. It's our summer. But we can go down south to the Rim Fire in California in okay. 2013. Now, okay, it was in California, not Alaska, but Alaskan crews went down to fight that fire, so we Fair can enough. talk about it here on Alaska weather. Here we have... Uh, a 3.7 micron channel shot of the of the rim fire again kind of a horseshoe shape showing right. that active fire front down there and then we'll look again to the day night band the visible light and then you can see how the fire is all bright you can see the active fire front and actually the the city lights over there too turns yes. out that the cities while they're active in a social sense are not really hot in a fire sense so um, they don't show up in the 3.7 micron they're not hot like a fire is but the fire in the cities look the same from a visible light perspective and a fun thing here too is that we can see the smoke plume going north from the rim wow. fire on the uh on the day-night band. So yeah. if we were ever to have, like in 2004 in Alaska, you get mm -hmm. dark at night, we still had an active fire season that year. Right. That was, right. A, you know, that really bad year. The day-night band didn't exist then, but it, if we had fires now in August, we could use it then. The lesson here is weather satellites, they offer many different wavelengths of light. Uh -huh. Some are used for different purposes, and some of these we just looked at tonight are especially helpful here in Alaska to find and to track the behavior of these wildfires so the crews can go out there and do their jobs. Sure, sure. So a satellite toolbox for the, the firefighting crews and the fire weather forecasters, and it just underlines how important satellites are, uh, especially for Alaska and our, our mission for the National Weather Service to uh, protect life and property and uh, also to enhance the national economy. So wonderful mm -hmm. stuff there, Eric. And people can look at pictures uh, like this anytime by going to gina.alaska.edu. Uh, you'll find images there all around Alaska at various times of the year and not just about fire weather, but uh, volcanic ash and smoke and uh, anything else you want to check out. They're always beautiful pictures and always interesting to look at no matter what time of the day. Thanks again for joining us, Eric. We appreciate it and welcome you back anytime uh, for this edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. See you next time. Gosh, that Eric guy is swell, isn't he? You can check out all those videos and all of Eric's best and greatest hits on our YouTube channel if you go to NWS Anchorage. Just look those up under AK Weather Facts. Here's a look at the sea ice edge, and as I said, that northerly flow is pushing the ice edge further and further south, but notice there's still a nice little hole around St. Matthew Island there. Around Bristol Bay, the low pressure system and the warm air that's coming up the coast is kind of keeping this at bay, so to speak. Sorry for the pun. And uh, again, we're going to continue to see that southwesterly progression of the bigger ice. That's the higher concentration shaped in white and the uh, lesser concentrations in blue. So more to come. Check it out anytime at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice dot php. Thursday in southeast. Look. Things are getting better there. The wind's slowing down, 20 to 30 knots there with four to seven foot seas on the inside and still looking at higher seas across the outer coast, 22 to as high as 24 feet in some cases along the outer coast with seas coming in uh, and the winds coming in from the south and southeast up to 25 to 30 knots. A little bit of a change as we get into Friday. Northerlies coming down the inner channels at 15 to 20. Look for seas around two to three feet. Uh, northeasterly wind coming off of Craig and the Dixon entrance region, 14 foot seas there. Otherwise, southerly still working up the outer coast at 15 to 20 for Friday. For south central, northerlies coming down Cook Inlet at 20 knots with four to six foot seas. Westerlies over Shelikoff Strait and over Kodiak Island at 30 knots with a 15 foot sea on the eastern side. Looking for southwesterlies coming up the western Gulf Coast, but meeting up with south and easterly winds inside and outside of Prince William Sound, 30 to 35 there with small crafts and uh, seven foot seas on the inside, 19 foot seas on the outside, though, still tapping into some of those higher seas working up from the north and eastern side. Friday, the flow reverses course. Southerly is working back up Cook Inlet. Light winds in the north end and southwesterly is as strong as 25 knots there inside of Shelikoff Strait. We'll see lighter winds east of Kodiak Island, but look for 10 to 20 knots in the north and western Gulf. 
Seas diminish to two feet inside of Prince William Sound for Friday. Southwesterly is across the Alaska Peninsula for the most part on Thursday. Seven to eight foot seas across the Bering Sea coast and 16 to 19 foot seas across the Pacific with winds around 35 knots there for Friday. Look for about similar conditions. Uh, 25 knots inside of Bristol Bay with a seven foot sea. Higher seas the further down the coast you go and southwesterly is on the Pacific coast. 30 to 35 with 17 to 19 foot seas on Friday. Across the Aleutians, look for a west and southwesterly flow, 25 to as high as 40 knots on either side of Adak and Atka. 15 foot seas on the Bering Sea coast, a little bit higher on the Pacific side. North and westerly winds on the western end from Kiska to Attu. And look for 19 foot seas south and west of Nikolski. For Friday, more of a southerly flow works back into the Bering. 30 knot winds in most cases there, 10 to 12 foot seas on the northern side, 14 to 15 foot seas on the Pacific side. We get a south Easterly flow going from Adak to Kiska and northwesterly is opposing that. That puts our front right about here and that draws up that warmer air ahead of it. Northwesterlies could be as high as 35 knots on the western side of that with 14 foot seas. Across the west coast, northerlies. Of course, we've got blizzard conditions. We've got growing ice. Of course, it's a northerly wind, 35 to 40 knots in the bearing until you get into Kuskokwim Bay and the Priblovs with 20 to 25 knots, 7 to 8 foot seas there by Friday. A little bit of a change. Where's low pressure? Right about here, and that's bringing up that warmth into the YK Delta again. 20 to 25 knots. Look for 8-foot seas across Kuskokwim Bay and the Pribilovs with northerlies opposing that. 30 knots with an 8-foot sea around St. Matthew for now until the ice gets there, of course. Here's a look at the north slope. Easterlies moving around the Beaufort Sea, 25 to 30, and then northerlies dropping into the Chukchi Sea coast at 20 to 25 by Friday. Winds diminish a little bit out toward Point Barrow, down to 15 knots. Those winds are slowing down a little bit for the Chukchi Sea coast, but holding steady at 25 knots outside of Kotzebue Sound for Friday along the Arctic coast. Now here's a recap of tonight's weather across Alaska. We're still looking at winter weather advisories for the Klondike Highway. As snow starts to taper off, most of that will be above 2,500 feet. Watch for melting though. If any of that snow melts, that's going to make it slippery travel up the Klondike Highway. We have a winter weather advisories for the Beaufort Sea Coast. Blizzard warnings continue for the St. Lawrence Island region. Be careful out there. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. For three years, I worked at the post office. You're just reading a number and putting it in the slots. These days, a working woman must have a skill. So I enrolled in the HIM program. I took a couple of classes and I really enjoyed it. And then I just completed my certificate for coding. I really enjoyed my instructors. It was really exciting. And now I love my job.